Uh, Madam Ambassador, thank you for being on my channel, Contra Commentary. Let's start with the opening question. As far as I see from your CV, you come from the media and NGO sector into the you know, top level politics. So how does it feel, you know, this sudden change from the media, from my chair on your chair, so to say? Well, uh, we have the opportunity in the United States to come in and out of our government. Yeah. So I had the opportunity to serve in the Obama administration, in the Pentagon, and the White House. And now, of course, I'm representing the United States at NATO. But you're right. I have a lot of experience working in research institutions, or what we call think tanks, on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think the benefit by coming in and out of Europe throughout my career is I've had times where I've been able to do long-term analysis and thinking and writing, but I've also had the opportunity to get in where the policy is made and in a much more fast-moving environment make a different type of contribution. So I enjoy both types of opportunities, but I'm especially pleased to be at NATO right now because of everything that's going on in the world. And it gives me opportunities also to travel to countries like your own, to come to Bulgaria, hear from Bulgarians what they're focused on, how they're looking at the threat environment, and get some interesting feedback and insights on the Black Sea in particular. Speaking of media, quite recently uh, we hear from the media news that uh, you know Russian Federation claims that NATO and the United States particularly, they cheated Soviet Union and Russian Federation after that of NATO not getting you know extended on the east to the borders of the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation. So they like to Gorbachev, for example. Uh, have you seen any proofs of that or disproofs that this ever happened in the history? Well, Russia likes to put out a lot of misinformation and counter narratives that aren't necessarily rooted in fact. And they have had kind of a revised history version of what happened after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the dismantling of the Soviet Union. Over the years, we've heard them make claims that the West or NATO allies or the United States were trying to weaken Russia in one way, shape, or another. In truth, what the United States working with many countries in Europe was trying to do was to help integrate Russia and bring them into a dialogue about our future collective security, how we could tackle shared challenges like terrorism or other threats. And in fact, what NATO did is it actually created in the late 1990s a NATO-Russia council that would allow Russia, not as a member, but to come in and be a partner at the table to sit among equals and talk about some of our shared challenges. Unfortunately, instead of taking advantage of some of those forums and bridging the gap between Russia and Europe and the United States to bring us closer together to work on shared challenges, we found now that Russia has opted for an alternative course. It went into Crimea in 2014. It also rent what went into Georgia in 2008, and most recently, it started this unprovoked war of aggression in Ukraine. Now, because Russia is not achieving its strategic objectives, it's very keen to put out a lot of disinformation. But we are working together with our friends in Bulgaria and all our NATO allies on this disinformation challenge so that we can get the truth out and make sure that our publics understand that ultimately NATO is a force for good. Well, NATO is a force for, for good. I don't doubt this, but you know, considering the current, current situation in the Middle East, it seems to have the potential to escalate into a larger conflict. So uh, how does you know, the recent development in Israel and the war in Gaza how does this look from the Washington and Brussels perspective? Two days ago, President Biden traveled to Israel and he wanted to do a couple of things. He wanted to offer his solidarity and support to our friends in Israel in the face of these tragic, tragic terrorist attacks. He also wanted to hear about how the United States could provide additional assistance. But he was very keen in also sending a message to all of the regional players about the importance of not allowing this to spill over into a wider regional conflict that continues to be our message 
message, and you'll see U.S. engagement on getting humanitarian support into Gaza, to making sure that we press our friends in Israel to minimize any civilian casualties, and that, again, we encourage the actors in the region not to take action and get involved in this specific war. Many of our friends have questions about whether or not we can do all of that and help our friends in Ukraine. But our answer on that is a resounding yes. We believe that we can do both, that we can help Ukraine counter Russian aggression, and we can help Israelis in their time of need cope with Hamas terrorists. Yeah, quite often we stress the point that NATO is a defensive uh, pact. But, you know, how specifically can NATO play a role in managing the tension in the uh, Israel crisis? Because what we see from the news outlets, you know, is United States and NATO sending uh, plane carriers to the Gulf. So. Well, in the case of NATO's role as it relates to what's happening in Israel and Gaza, there is not a direct NATO role for the alliance. However, last week all the NATO defense ministers, including Bulgaria's defense yep. ministers, met and we were able to hear directly from the Israeli Minister of Defense about the current operation, what their needs and requirements are, and we could ask questions. What the Israeli Minister of Defense heard in that engagement engagement was strong solidarity. We stood in support of our friends in Israel, and we can condemn the attacks that had occurred. So while there may not be a direct role for the NATO alliance, I think our focus will continue to be on Ukraine, but NATO allies will individually find ways to support their friends in Israel going forward. And also Ukraine, it's a part of the questions which our, our you know, world today has to solve. So after the Hamas attack over Israel, the president of Ukraine, he came to NATO headquarters to get reassurance that the support will not stop support from, for, uh, for Ukraine. So it looks like Ukraine is on the back burner right now. Is it so? No. In fact, when President Zelensky came to Brussels last week, he was able to walk into a meeting with 50 countries from around the world, not just NATO allies, but 50 countries that are providing direct security assistance to Ukraine. And he left that meeting not just with political solidarity, but he actually left the meeting with real concrete forms of assistance for Ukraine things that they need right now, air defense, ammunition, artillery, offers of those kinds were on the table in the meeting. So from President Zelensky's perspective, I think it's safe to say that he left the meeting feeling that these countries that come together on a monthly basis will continue to stand with Ukraine. The American support for, you, for Ukraine depends to some extent on the Congress, you know, lower, upper chamber, so considering the state of affairs in the House these days, the impossibility to elect a new speaker, do you think this will affect the foreign policy, especially of the President of the United States, especially in the field of uh, international security? This is a common question we get. We get a lot of questions about process. Why does the House currently lack a Speaker of the House, and when will this get resolved? We have seen attempts by the Republicans to move out on electing a Speaker by the whole House, and I think they, they will eventually get there. Unfortunately, they aren't there today. But I think our broader bu budgetary debates will ultimately get resolved. They always do. This is something we've seen in the past. It can be a blip. It can create some delay. Although I will say we have resources and authorities from last year to continue drawing down assistance for Ukraine. So the assistance to Ukraine is steady and will keep flowing. And in fact, just two weeks ago, we announced another package of $200 million of support. So I think our friends in Ukraine will see the assistance continue to flow. Also, I would note that the president is about to submit a request for $100 billion. Not all of that is for Ukraine, but a significant portion of it actually is for Ukraine. And we will see, I think it's safe to predict, bipartisan support in the House, in the Senate, to continue supporting Ukraine. And uh, second to the last question is about the expansion of NATO. Uh, yes, the war in Ukraine 
looks like you know it made the idea of NATO and being a member of NATO more popular and more understandable for many societies. But still, we see this uh, you know Sweden; it's still on the doorstep of NATO, and uh, a particular reaction of Turkey on that question. So, do you expect any changes by the end of this year or in any near future regarding Sweden being a, becoming a member, a NATO member? member? We do. President Erdogan came to the summit in Vilnius, Lithuania, in July and made a pledge to NATO allies that he will get this done. He will complete the ratification process this fall. We knew that their parliament would be in recess for several months over the summer into September. But now that the Turkish parliament has reconvened and is out of recess, we do expect that in the coming weeks, Turkey will complete the ratification process. We have also been assured by our friends in Hungary that they similarly will get the ratification process completed. And so our hope is very much that all of this is wrapped up and Sweden will take its proper seat at the table as a full-fledged member by the end of this calendar year. Uh, in Bulgaria, the question of NATO bases in Bulgaria, quite often it's being misused by the, some parties, political parties. What's, you know, and also we have the example of Germany uh, when the American military bases moved to some other you know, neighboring countries. I would say some people weren't quite happy with that. So what's the perspective? Is it just a media smoke or it's a real possibility of new bases of NATO in Bulgaria? And what will the local people gain by or lose by having you know, such new settlements? We have a pretty simple message on this question, and that is that the NATO forces that are here as part of the battle group are here to protect Bulgarian citizens against outside threats. We are not here as the United States or as NATO to impose anything on Bulgaria that it doesn't want. But what we heard from the government of Bulgaria is that they would be interested in hosting one of these battle groups where a bunch of NATO countries come together to form a battalion and these forces are able to train and exercise together and prepare for any contingencies that Bulgaria may face. So this is for Bulgaria. It's not against Bulgaria. It is a net plus in our minds because it is enhancing your deterrence and it's enhancing your defense. Bulgaria struggles between its pro-European, pro-NATO orientation. Recent, you know, uh, researches show that most, you know, majority of Bulgarians, they support uh, and they value more Bulgaria being an EU member and a NATO member. But still, still there is a serious, you know, pro-Russian sentiment in Bulgaria in a political sense. How does this look from your perspective, from the NATO perspective, you know, this bi bipolarity of Bulgarian political and, you know, civil society? Well, we would encourage Bulgarian citizens and civil society to continue supporting its membership in both institutions. The European Union plays a very, very important role for Bulgaria, and the United States supports that wholeheartedly, even though we're not a member of the European Union, but we believe in the European project and want to see Bulgaria cooperate closely with the EU. But similarly, we don't want it to be either or. We yeah. don't want Bulgaria Bulgaria just to invest in one institution. There's a very different institution, and that is NATO, that really focuses exclusively on Bulgaria's security and defense, although it's also helpful in an array of other challenges like cyber attacks or disinformation or building resilience. So we would encourage the citizens of Bulgaria to maintain their commitment to both organizations. They can help this country. They can bring greater prosperity and safety to the people of, of Bulgaria. And we believe that we need Bulgaria in these institutions. We need Bulgarian insights. We need to share lessons learned. Maybe we need their perspectives. Maybe that's the point. How to convince those who are skeptical that you, I mean not you personally, but NATO, European Union, whatever, 
they need us also, Bulgarians. Absolutely. Well. It's a two-way street. It's not just about NATO imposing something. It's about NATO gaining insights from Bulgaria and Bulgaria tr contributing to the alliance. And I just want to be clear, nothing happens in the NATO alliance unless all 31 nations agree, soon to be 32. If Bulgaria puts its hand up, that's enough to stop something inside the NATO alliance. And so every member of the alliance has control, political control over this organization. We have a secretary general, but ultimately it is the nations that drive NATO policy, and we very much want Bulgaria to be a part of that. We started the conversation at the very end of it. So thank you. Ms. Thank Ambassador. you. Appreciate thank you it. Much. Take care.